So welcome uh, to you all, um, all those we can see only in the chat. We would love to meet uh, in the near future when um, face-to-face -face gatherings will be possible again. But in the meantime, this is a, a wonderful tool to actually connect around the world on essential topics uh, of interest to the development and future of higher education, short, medium and long term. So I'm uh, Secretary General of the International Association of Universities. I'm very pleased to welcome you to this uh, special session uh, of the webinar series of the IU on the future of higher education. We are expecting quite a few attendees and we hope you will be all very active also in the chat box to ask questions along the way. That's always very good for the for the last part as well, because we want to hear from you. We want to exchange with you and the uh, speakers will be thrilled as well to engage in conversation. So this webinar series for those who come for the first time and those who've come already but have forgotten <laughs> the webinar series is something that the IAU is pleased to start in the spring, uh, also as a response to the pandemic and offering a, a different uh, platform that many um, other organizations also have seized as a as a platform for dialogue for exchange and uh, what we're very pleased to always offer is comparative or divergent diverse uh, perspectives from around the world on key topics that impact uh, the higher education uh, future in general so this series is called really the future of higher education the short and the medium and the long term because we want to look at what is happening today but we will also want to compare notes on what is happening and the kind of solutions that people are uh, drafting, developing and implementing in different parts of the world regarding the many challenges that they face. The medium term is also to look already into the future, even if we know that with the pandemic, the future is uncertain. But we can already know that certain uh, values upon which to build higher education are there to stay, that the leadership, the very topic of today's seminar, will be um, working on specific uh, issues that uh, were very important in the past, have been rocked along the way during the pandemic, but will certainly be picked up in different manners in the future. It's good to already discuss those. So over the, the, the course of the, the last few months, we've discussed issues of internationalization, the impact of COVID-19 on higher education in general, but also on the future of internationalization, the future of values. Uh, we've discussed academic freedom, uh, university autonomy. We've looked at strategies that are being developed at the higher education level, and I'm sure that Adam, uh, Mirta, and Tom will discuss these uh, very specific uh, aspects as well today. We've looked at uh, strategies to continue uh, teaching, learning, research, collaboration, cooperation. We've looked at exam issues and the digital transformation of higher education, uh, to name but a few. And as well, we looked at the broader topic of sustainable development. Today, we focus uh, more specifically on leadership and the challenges that uh, you as leaders face, uh, leadership in an evolving context, very fast evolving, and that is probably one of the the major uh, challenges that you face as well. There are new things every day, every hour at times. Um, and we invite you to look back uh, while also looking at the current realities and how to think about your future roles. So I give the floor to Andreas Corcoran, the uh, Deputy Secretary General of the IAU, to introduce the speakers mm -hmm. and also moderate the conversation. And I'll get back on the screen at the very end to maybe also share uh, one of my questions, if I can. So thank you. Thank you for being with us and uh, enjoy the session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hilliki, for this introduction. And uh, indeed, a very, very warm welcome uh, to Mirta Martin, to Adam Habib, and also to Tom Kenny, who is uh, going to come in onto the screen in just a few seconds. Uh, it is a wonderful, uh, uh, wonderful to have you. Thank you so much for uh, making time to talk to us today about leadership in an evolving context. Um, we have already in the blurb made uh, the note that these are fast changing times. It is often difficult to step back, make sense of the situation and learn from the experience of leading in and through a crisis. So what we'd like to do in this webinar today is to take stock and gain fresh insights into what approaches uh, to leading a university um, context requires and as the context evolves. So. 
We aim to shed light on the repertoire of leadership capabilities needed to deal with the present and the future um, by university leaders and also look into the future to help reimagine the ways in which current and future trends may shape higher education locally and, glo glo and globally. And for this, we have uh, three very fine speakers and friends of the International Association of Hebrew Universities. And uh, uh, for one, it is Adam Habib, Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of Witwatersrand, Witz in Johannesburg. And uh, very soon, I hear, in the incoming director of ZOAS, the School of Oriental and Asian Studies, uh, University of London. And uh, since I am speaking from the UK and Tom is speaking from the UK, a very warm welcome. And uh, we're still rooting for you to actually make it to the UK, uh, despite all the uh, Corona <laughs> restrictions. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, Mirta Martin, wonderful to see you on the screen. She is the member of uh, the IAU Administrative Board. And... Um, and also, the, of course, the U.S. president, sorry, not the U.S. president, not yet, maybe next, <laughs> maybe four <laughs> years to come, but she's the president of Fairmont State University in the U.S. Um, and then we have Tom Kenny, a longtime friend of uh, the IAU. He is the director at Renmore, uh, a consultancy business in the U.K., and an honorary senior fellow at the University of Melbourne. Again, welcome. What we have decided today is that we're going to have a structured conversation uh, around the themes of uh, leadership in an evolving context. And uh, Tom Kenny very kindly uh, will kick off with uh, his volunteer to show some slides and give a brief presentation about a framework that he and uh, his colleagues have um, uh, have, have come up with that will give us a backbone to this conversation today. Uh, so without any further ado, I give the floor to Tom Kenny. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas, and thank you to all of you for uh, being able to join us today. Very much looking forward to the, the conversation. So as Andreas said, I'm going to share with you um, a few thoughts on a, a framework which evolved out of my experience of working with leaders across the UK and, and to some extent in Australia over the last nine months. And uh, it uh, emerged from some work I was doing with a fellow colleague uh, about a book which is coming out next year, uh, early next year, on leadership transitions at the top in the universities. And our challenge was really to try and distill the experience of having worked with many vice chancellors and presidents over the years, what were some of the, the seminal influential factors along the way. Uh, during the process, it became apparent to us that actually there was one theme which was just not covered by our book, and that was the challenge of leading in a crisis. Uh, the chapter title, uh, don't forget BC before COVID, get through DC, you can work it out, uh, and focus on, I hope, after COVID. And that's the, the challenge I was setting myself back in March, April, to try and work through the year and see if I could sense make for myself let alone for anybody else, what was happening during this period. So, uh, caution, all leadership is contextual. Uh, and so my perspectives are merely one of many uh, that are important for us to recognize. And the value of this session, of course, is we can hear many different experiences from many different parts of the globe. So this is just one as a, a kickstart to the conversation. I'm the warm up act to the uh, what I hope will be a very rich conversation which will continue on. So let me uh, get started then. So of course, evolving contexts are not new. Uh, remember back to 2019, can you really remember back that far? Uh, there was a thing called a VUCA world and you're probably saying, what's a VUCA world, Tom? Uh, and what, well, it's, it's a remember for some of you, it was that world of volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity. Um, and of course, none of that's gone away. Uh, uh, that, that remains the context we have been living through. But it, for me, it didn't quite capture the, the richness or the, the experience because then things got a bit more complicated as we came into 2020. And as we came into 2020, I decided we needed a new additional acronym, which is equally, equally non-memorable, 
a jive's world. So, Tom, what's a jive's world? Well, the jive's world was the following. It was global. You get my drift. It was interdependent. It was scary. Uh, and it's been escalating. Uh, I don't know what it's been like in your part of the globe, but those are certainly the experiences. And, of course, if you're leading in this type of environment, there's maybe a different set of capabilities we need to think about. So what was I observing and seeing? I was seeing the need for leaders to be absolutely able to stand back and, as they have in all contexts, see the big picture, but also have a detailed understanding. <clears throat> one, one of the two were missing that I felt we were seeing challenges, but getting both is important. The interdependent part became much more use of scenarios and scenario oh. thinking. It might be a topic we may return to later today or on another occasion. But having to think about futures which and interdependencies between decisions you're taking and what might happen. So the what if question became a constant theme throughout the year and I'm, it will continue to do so. But it was rather than seeing scenarios as something which is an episodic thing we do every five or so years when we're doing a new strategic plan, it became something we were doing almost on a week by week basis as you were grappling with the challenge of what is the decision we should take? Do we go online? Do we open access to campus? If so, how and when? Do we do assessments? If so, how and when? And so on and so on. The scary part absolutely brought to the fore the need for support and empathy from staff and from leaders to really demonstrate and live that through their work. And escalation meant decisions which you took had to be informed by what was happening in the moment. So emergent thinking became crucially important. And also the ability to say, I think we need to change our decision we made last week in the light of new intelligence, new information. So there was no longer this sort of certainty that could go with it, all decisions that we were making. What else? In recent uh, months, I've, I've had a sense of, we, we're seeing this as something where we, we need some hope. Uh, and the last couple of weeks certainly has given me more hope, even yesterday with the Oxford vaccine coming through and being uh, suggested maybe a way forward. There's a real sense of an uplift after a very challenging time, but we've got a way to go yet. So the leadership challenge remains about constant hope giving. The scenarios process, I think, is a way in which the eye can involve me, find, give me a part to play. Um, literally, Monday, I was running a session uh, at a university using scenario thinking, involving all of the leadership team. And we're going to be repeating that in a couple of weeks' time with the governing body of the university to really think about what are the futures, not a vision future, but what are the multiplicity and how do we prepare for that? Support and empathy often is, as leaders, trying to make sense of things for me. Uh, I remember one leader I heard, uh, we invited one of our presentations, talked about their job was a bit like looking through a kaleidoscope, they said. And the best I could do some days was just freeze frame that kaleidoscope and describe what I could see, knowing full well as suddenly after it had changed, I, I let go, it would change again. But for a moment, somebody was making sense of what was in front of us. And I think constantly I'm seeing really effective leaders doing that sense making. And the last part is empower me, allow me to play a role, uh, encourage me to take action, uh, Decisions don't require to be constantly going back up to the top of the tree for a decision. They need to be something which you can be empowered to get on with and so on. So those were some of my early thoughts on what I was seeing and the challenges of leading in this new environment. The second framework I'll, I'll share with you was my attempt to distill what I was seeing through a number of different leadership lenses almost on COVID. Um, this initially started as a linear model, and it very clearly became apparent to me it wasn't linear. It was just different ways of looking at the leadership process and different capabilities at different stages. 
So if I look at it through the UK lens, way back in March, absolutely those early days were about command and control. I saw leaders in universities forming small teams, getting a grip, establishing a way by which we will operate, and really having to be quite firm in terms of the decisions they were taking. You know, this was not a time for the vice chancellor to set up a series of working parties which would con consult widely and come back in six months with some options and possibilities. It was a need for firm, decisive action at the beginning. As we went into lockdown and lockdown one, as we, we would maybe call it in the UK context, again, we saw this need for a, a very quite direct style, but developmental. Developmental in the sense we were learning fast on our feet. We remember back to our first Teams meeting or Zoom meeting, what it was like for you, I don't know. I remember being terrified by it. Uh, nine months on, it's a daily routine, which we go through all the time. So we've learned to adapt, but we've also had to come up with new and different ways of working. So how do we engage people? How do we listen carefully? How do we make sure we're getting the engagement? So developmental learning was important at that stage. Whoops. Let's see what's happened here. I need to go back slightly. And then we went on too far. Apologies for your eye strain at this moment. I will catch up with myself. So, ah. the time we got to this third stage, leading through the dark days, and the dark days might be just in the same day you have an up day and a bad day, uh, a, a moment of elation in the morning and doom and gloom in the afternoon. But more seriously, when people had issues that led to losses or uh, illness among team members, that's when being a values-led organisation comes to the fore and demonstrating we're living those values through the way in which we're operating become much more significant. For some universities at some stages, there was a, a moment when you were actually having to lead without leaders uh, or the leader themselves, perhaps through a raft of a range of dis range of issues which might have arisen. And that's where the need for a distributed and delegated approach to decision making has become much more significant. So preparing and anticipating what if we were going to have to deal with a situation of that nature. And so that became a an element through which to think about the leadership challenge. Leading performance positively, I, I began to see as a challenge, and that remains, I think, in the beginning, it was seen as a temporary condition. And if we had individuals who we were getting anxious about because they didn't seem to be uh, engaging so constructively, or conversely, and I've seen equal numbers, if not m many more, in fact, situations where somebody was over performing, over anxious, delivering well above the demands of the role, uh, and one needed to have a quiet word to say, it's okay, Tom, you're doing a fantastic job, but I don't need you to be on screen from six in the morning till uh, three in the morning, you know, and those sorts of extreme sort of ways of behaving. To do that on Zoom and remotely, to manage performance remotely is a whole new skill set, which I think we're just getting to grips with as we speak. But doing it by, be, by, by being contextually informed and sensitively enacted. Uh, Zoom is possibly not the best tool to use for that. Getting on the phone can be equally valid. Throughout this, the sort of importance of these care, compassion, communication dimensions became even more significant. As we emerged in the summer, at least in the UK context, of a period of out of lockdown, there was a real sense of optimism, but also a sense of how do we retain those things which we really valued? I had my first face-to-face -face engagement with a university in July. We met in a huge library. We were socially distanced. We had a fantastic day uh, of development with them. And it was all about what are we gonna hold on to? Needless to say, two months later, that no longer is possible. Um, but it was really about how do we adapt to this and learn from that experience. Increasingly, universities are also looking to the medium to long-term scenarios and thinking about well, 
How do we prepare the way for the future? What are the alternative futures that could arise? And how are we going to anticipate those? And that's become much more significant, I would say, probably in the last couple of months. And certainly going into 21 in the UK, a much more, I think we've just got a mindset where we're, we're able to think about a medium to long term. Up until this point in the year, it's been all hands to the deck. Let's just keep the keep the university open. Let's keep the students uh, well serviced in terms of their online and hybrid learning and so on and so forth. Now we're beginning to see the possibility of thinking beyond that. I think it's also been a period I've seen where the role of the university in their communities uh, and with partners has been something which has really come to the fore. It's been some fantastic ex examples of the importance of a university in any city or any locality is crucial. In today's environment, it's become even more significant as a, a place where there's expertise, there's a capacity to support the community. And indeed seeing groups of universities coming together a good friend in Australia, uh, Shitish Kapoor, who's the Dean of Medicine at uh, Melbourne, formed a, a group of a uh, hundred of the most senior scientists in Australia, formed a, a, a group of eight a community of leaders, scientists, to offer <clears throat> a perspective, a route map to recovery. This was to be back in May in uh, Australia. And it was done with superb capacity to distill the lessons of experience from scientists to offer to the, the government of Australia. These are our thoughts. And it didn't come with a big price tag attached. It came with a genuine, authentic, these are the experts who can offer the following advice. And it was extremely well considered at the time. It's been a time when resilience has been absolutely paramount at a personal level to help people help ourselves, how do, how do you and how have you been able to uh, engage and find respite from the, the, the periods of, of lockdown or whatever has been the situation in your context? And I think for leaders, the leading organisational resilience um, and getting the right balance between optimism and realism. Um, if there's too much optimism and it looks as if you don't understand what life is like for me, it's not going to work. Um, but equally, if it's highly pessimistic with no sense of a bias for optimism, it's equally not going to be effective. So getting that right balance became much more significant. And then the last of my uh, lenses was, was innovation. Throughout this nine month period, I have seen endless examples of superb innovation at many levels. Um, and I think that bottom-up engagement and encouragement of innovation at a local level is increasingly the opportunity area, I think, for us as we go into 21 in the UK context. And I think it's been an opportunity <clears throat> for university leaders to, to really have themselves challenge assumptions about what is and isn't possible. Now, I know everyone's gone to some form of remote learning. Uh, some would say they've gone into blended learning in a very sophisticated way. Uh, I'm not so persuaded. There are some who are superb. Some, it's been a, well, it's just been an emergency response to a situation. But it was possible literally within weeks for universities to do something which in many cases, in my experience, we've been talking about wishing to do and go blended for quite a number of years. Suddenly. The, the assumption was we can do this and we will do this and that's what happened. So I think as we go into the next phase, challenging our assumptions uh, that perhaps we can do more uh, change and innovation uh, and show examples and showcase some of the examples of what's been happening so far. So this set of lenses uh, uh, demands of leaders courage and ability to work together to co-create futures and options, but above all, encourage and enhance the creativity uh, of the places within which you've got so many amazing creative individuals. So how do we capitalize upon that? Finally, just to, to conclude then, my last part was to really add a sec section at the, the middle for me that where 
teamworking, where trust, and above all, transparency uh, were highlighted and emphasized. This has allowed us to see a way through a very difficult, demanding time. Uh, as a, and I'll be interested in the, the views from my co-hosts as being in the front line as the, the pinnacle of, if you like, of leadership as a president and vice chancellor can be a very lonely time at the best of times. And the current environment is even perhaps lonelier unless you can build around you that sort of real strong team sense and, and have a few trusted individuals with whom you can uh, convene and, and, and talk. Just as an experiment, for example, back in March, I was working with four individual vice chancellors in the UK, uh, and I was working with them each individually as they transitioned into taking over the role right at the heart of, at the height, in the heat of COVID uh, and doing uh, transition coaching work with them. I suggested to a couple of them, you know, would there be any merit in us coming together as a group? So we formed a virtual action learning group of four people and we come together once a month for two and a half hours and they have the peer support of another three colleagues who are going through exactly the same experience. It's been a revelation to me that it was possible, but to them I think just having that sort of engagement. So new and different ways of teams of senior leaders as well as teams within the university itself. So I offer that as a, a framework or two just to kick off the conversation. I'm sure some of these will not resonate with you. Uh, they'll form in different ways. If any of them do, I'd be interested. If any of them you think are opportunities that need further enhancement. And But what else has been happening in your environment? And how can we continue the, the dialogue around examples uh, that we can use as we go into this conversation. So, Andreas, I offer those as a, a starter for the conversation. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much, Tom. And thank you also for really taking us back through the various phases uh, of uh, this very unique experience. Uh, who, who of us has ever encountered a pandemic in our lifetime, um, and uh, especially a global one? Uh, and indeed, taking us back through the various phases in uh, leadership terms and, uh, and connecting them to the capabilities and the virtues that you identified as, uh, as needed to, in order to, uh, to surmount the challenges. Yes, thank you so much. You've already put some questions there and we'll definitely keep them uh, on the screen for now. And indeed, I would like to give the word possibly to start off to Adam. Um, in South Africa and uh, connect possibly some of the um, capabilities and virtues that we've just heard with your experience over the last, what is it, 10 months now or eight months, nine months uh, of the pandemic and uh, and then also take us into the future. We'll do that in a, uh, a bit later, but but the, also to, to set the scene of the work uh, environment that you're in, in South Africa and um give us an give us an uh, give us a, some indication of the challenges that you are facing within the south african framework uh that'd be wonderful thank you very much so uh andreas thank you very much uh, uh tom thank you for those words and those that that advice and that framework in many ways uh it resonates with with uh, with me uh, in quite powerful ways Obviously, in not exactly the same uh, logic, but it does resonate. And I want to highlight three issues. You started by saying that leadership is contextual. And I think that that's absolutely true, but I want to give some extra meat to it. And I want to say it's contextual in two senses. It's contextual in a spatial sense in the spatial environment within your work, in the country, in the socioeconomic, higher education and political system you operate. But the second contextual variable to consider is historical moment. So even if you're in the same spatial framework, it would be very different in January 2020 and in July 2020. So the moment changes, mm. it seems to me that that's something that has a very, very big difference. So I wanted to highlight that, but I wanted to qualify it 
both in the spatial and the historical sense. So that's the first thing that I want to put. The second position I'd like to put on the table is I think you're absolutely right that when you hit an, a major crisis like we did in March, at least in Johannesburg, around COVID-19, which was probably four weeks later, four and a half weeks later to everybody else, we first were able to see what was playing out in other parts of the world. But secondly, what it required was, you know, in those early days, there was utter confusion. It was like having a deer in headlights and everybody trying to figure out what to do. And in that context, leadership meant to be decisive. It meant what you called, as I understand it, taking command and control and saying, here's the challenge and here's what we've got to move. So in a sense, you read all of those leadership books and they tell you about decentralized leadership and they tell you about servant leadership and all of that. And frankly, in those early days, all of that goes out of the window. What you want to do is you want to identify a challenge, you want to focus on it, and you want to mobilize your executive team so that they start feeling empowered and they start in that direction. So what that meant in the South African context is twofold. One is, firstly, a lot of people were saying, well, we shouldn't be going online. Let's shut down the university. Let's go home and we'll come back to this problem in a year's time. Uh, and that wasn't going to happen simply because my mandate as a vice chancellor, and I suspect any president of a university anywhere in the world, is to ensure that we deliver an academic program and not to forsake that economic, that educational program at the first hint of a challenge. So that's the first thing that happened. The second thing that happened is I had a whole series of politicians, I might add, malevolent politicians, I'd say, and activists who popped up and suddenly said, well, actually, if everything cannot be equal, lots of poor people don't have access to devices. They don't have access to laptops. So therefore, we shouldn't proceed online because it will be unequal and it would be unfair to poor people. And what that required, Andreas, is an interesting thing. It required a vice chancellor in that moment to stand up to politicians. And basically it required when a minister went up and said, we shouldn't be going online. My responsibility was to go public and say, actually social justice is not a reversion to the lowest common denominator. Our job is not to go to the lowest common denominator and therefore this. what it requires is an acknowledgement of inequality. And what it requires is a pragmatic solution to lend a helping hand. And what that meant in the South African context, as I said, I recognize the problem of poor people not having access to devices. And so what I'm going to do with the extra resources of the university, I'm going to purchase 5,000 laptops. And I'm going to distribute 5,000 laptops to students that don't have it because I was able to calculate, we had really calculated who, which students had devices or not. And then they said, well, you give laptops, but they don't have connectivity because they don't have data. And what that required is picking up the phone and phoning the CEOs of the three largest mobile companies and said, can I cut a deal with you? And actually, if you give me a good price, I will go public and say what great companies you are and how you have contributed to a very, very uh, urgent situation. And then the question was, how do you distribute that laptops to the students in the context of a pandemic where you're not allowed to do transport? So I phoned the National Service, a uh, postal service and said, if you do well, I will release a statement praising you how well you've done and how, urge, how you've responded to this. So the point about this is if you like, is two lessons come out of this. One is the value-based leadership. And the value-based leadership is don't forget social justice. Social justice is essential, but don't let social justice become the lowest common denominator. Don't let it disable you. What you've got to do is try and think through in your spatial context, 
how to address social justice. And the second thing that it requires is context. Context matters. If I was in London or Boston, I might not as urgently take up the issue of devices as if I was in South Africa, etc. So context matters. And for me, what the word in that is, is what I call radical pragmatism. It's I coined this term. We radical, we still committed to social justice, but we pragmatic. We don't operate in a world we wish existed. We operate in a world that does exist. And you adapt to address your social justice issues in that regard. So that was the second thing I want to do. And then finally, uh, 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 Andreas, what I want to raise is what I'm going to pose this as a question because I think we'll come back to this. And that is never waste a crisis. Because however much this crisis emerged, it created an incredible set of opportunities. I could remember for two years or three years, I was debating about being blended. And I'd have 70% of my academics complaining. There were 30% saying, yes, we're going. But 70% were saying, no, 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 it's too difficult. It's not fair. You know, it's, uh, this, what suddenly happened is within the space of three weeks, all of them were online. Well, actually, to be honest, they weren't online. Mitha made this point the other day. We were basically in emergency remote learning. That's what we did. But suddenly, all of them are doing it. Now, when I debate with them about the possibility of blended learning, I don't have as much an opposition. So it would be a crazy thing as we exit this crisis to forget that momentum, use that momentum to reimagine higher education in the ways that is required in a new contemporary moment. And so I'll come back to that. But it seems to me the lesson is don't waste the crisis. Use the crisis in the ways that we can enable a particularly reimagination of higher education. Because I think we're entering a moment globally where not only the world is changing, but higher education itself has to be reimagined to the changing world that we're operating in. I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Mm. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. Yes, don't let a good crisis go to waste indeed. <laughs> and let me just add to uh, the context that you said. Uh, what struck me also is, of course, uh, the context in a geographical or geopolitical way or even in a, uh, in a way of in terms of social capital. If you are as a university leader in South Africa and you actually have access to the three leading telecommunication companies, plus the postal service, and also could potentially endorse them, then of course it also shows in some light on what higher education institutions have kind of a role in that particular context. Um, that was just a, a, an additional uh, uh, observation on your fantastic three points or three themes that you've already pointed out. Thank you very much for that. And uh, we'll shoot straight over to West Virginia uh, in uh, the eastern states of uh, U the United States of America. And let's hope they are very united at the moment and will be in future. Mirta, thank you very much. Uh, again, a question to you, uh, please. Uh, could you uh, please enlighten us on some of the challenges that you faced in terms of leadership uh, over the last uh, few months during the crisis and possibly taking also into consideration uh, the framework of the capabilities and virtues that Tom identified for us? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas. And thank you, Tom and Adam, for setting the stage. Uh, clearly, uh, what my uh, two colleagues have done before is to paint a picture of leadership. And as um, Adam said, while much of it may be contextual, leadership is leadership. And in these times, uh, what I find is that individuals need to have a, a belief um, an individual that provides them an inspiration for something that is yet to come that is better than what we're facing. Indeed, for us in the United States, um, uh, the future of higher education is as complex and as urgent as the time in which we live. And for leaders, uh, it creates um, a conundrum. Uh, and the reason for it is because across the United States, 
colleges and universities are striving to educate the world's future history makers through periods defined by division, by disease, and regrettably by discord. Many of our schools are doing so with leadership uh, in the face of dwindling resources and daunting challenges to the health and safety of their students, staff, and their faculties. Nevertheless, because of leadership, because of decisive leadership, colleges and universities across the United States continue to display a time honor resiliency, all while maintaining their hallowed role in advancing the social imperative that I will quote Lyndon Johnson articulated in a 1968 message to Congress. And that message was, above all, we can see a new spirit staring in America, moving us to stress a new and central importance of education, to seek ways to make education more vital and more widely available. And certainly I think that's today the issue and the point of leadership throughout the world is how do we make education more vital and more widely available to all those who seek it. For us in West Virginia, not unlike in regions of the world, and, and certainly uh, Adam just spoke about the needs in South Africa, we find ourselves in a state where access to Wi-Fi and broadband are, are diminished if, if, if existent. And so when the pandemic hit, we were trying to provide and finish up a year to individuals who later told me stories as those as we may hear of our grandparents or our great grandparents and, uh, and, and regrettably of many students to, today throughout the world and of the need to have to travel um, a mile, five miles, kilometers uh, to sit in the parking lot of a McDonald's or, or, or a company so they could use their Wi-Fi to finish their homework. In America, we're also challenged in that prior to the pandemic, fall 2019 enrollment figures tabulated by the National Student Clearinghouse and Research Center reveal that colleges and universities enrolled roughly 200,000 less students than they did during the fall of 2018. And because of the pandemic, the fall of 2020 indicated a further 3% reduction in the number of students who pursued higher education in the United States. This is critical for presidents, for chancellors, because in American our public universities, are driven by tuition. And so without the students, the downward spiral comes about and universities throughout the United States are facing critical needs of, of being able to, to uh, balance the needs to supply and provide an exceptional education to their students, the need to keep their doors open in the face of a reduction of enrollment and a need to be able to address all the needs of their faculty and their staff. So it, it, it leadership has become ever much more critical in the face of a pandemic. Leaders are faced with innovation and uh, and to looking at external sources of income to be able to offset their needs. They're reaching out to older and more diverse student populations than they ever did before. For example, in America, a report from the American Council on Higher Education found that 45% of undergraduates matriculating in the fall of 2016 were students of color a trend that was expected to increase only as the nation's minority populations continue to grow and as it is expected to eventually become the majority. 
Regrettably, students or colors are much less likely to attain a degree despite increasing share of enrollment populations. And what this means for us, what it means for institutions is that we have to place a greater priority, financial and otherwise, on supporting these students in the face of the likelihood of lower attainments rates of graduation in the future. Again, this presents a conundrum in a face of a pandemic, in a face of, of diminishing resources. How do we attract individuals who will add support to our revenues, but yet who themselves need more resources? So how do we balance that? How is leadership looking to make decisions as to who is going to get what? Certainly it is, it is something that is being discussed, that is being um, um, forecasted throughout the United States and certainly in my own school. And so what many people are doing, what many leaders are doing are going back to industry models to be able to discern, do we run our schools as businesses, not for profit, but as businesses where we look to create a return on the investment or do we continue to run them in traditional ways? For some institutions, it's all about fit. Certainly, we have to invest when there are limited sources of income. We have to invest in that which yields the highest return on the investment so that then we can take that finite that finite resource and allocate it to other areas of the institution that are in critical need or for those programs that are critical to the institution, even though there's not as large a return on the investment. The need for collaboration with industry leader becomes ever much more essential because they have the finger on the pulse on how their industries are moving how their industries are changing. And so if they allow us and they allow our faculties to understand that dichotomy, to understand how they are, the paradigm is shifting, we in academia are able to also shift to provide our students with an education for programs that do not yet exist. Indeed, that is the future of leadership, is to be able to look beyond to imagine a better world, to be able to be the wellspring of inspiration and aspiration for our faculty, for our staff, for our students, for our regions, and in, in, in truth, for the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mirta, for these wise words. Uh, I'll uh, go straight over to Tom, uh, maybe uh, just uh, if you would have some first reactions uh, to the to the two speakers, and then we'll move on with a with a new set of questions. Thank you, Tom. Uh, yeah, love love both contributions. Really, really interesting. <clears throat> the, the the example uh, Adam gave of, of going after laptops, <coughs> um, uh, just a. a Anecdotal example from the UK. Can you imagine, Vice Chancellor, that one of the decisions you take is to buy a thousand bicycles? And that's what one Vice Chancellor in the UK did in Manchester at the University of Bolton, which is a commuter university. It was facing a very high level of, of COVID cases. And the critical thing was safety and security of students who were able to not take public transport, but to have their own transport to travel to the university. So the decision was taken to buy a thousand bikes. Very appropriate, exactly the right decision at the right moment. Um, so a, a really, you know, you sparked my, 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 my thinking on that one. I think the sort of command and control and innovation agenda, uh, an example which I think was particularly interesting was uh, the University of Edinburgh as an example. That both had, as every university had, a crisis team meeting every day of every, every morning, every week for the first three months. That was the sort of critical command and control center to 
It then, in addition to that, which became less frequent and was not as chaired often by the principal, began to introduce what it called adaptation and renewal teams. And these were designed to do exactly that process, which was to think about the beyond, the not the 2030 agenda, <clears throat> but to think about what are we going to do by September in terms of re-entry of students to the campus? How are we going to do the testing? How are we going to assess students in the short term? And so all of that sort of adaptation and renewal teamworking began to really take a grip and as again sort of formed a, a crucible, if you like, for some of that innovation and thinking uh, about, about the agenda. Um, the never waste a crisis issue, I think, is, is spot on. And we're seeing many examples of that and, and ideas which previously were deemed too difficult or, or not really possible. So we've had, we, we call it post-qualification admission, coming back into the on, the, on the front foot. It's something we've talked about for many years so that students uh, get their grades and then make the decision about which university to go to rather than it being done on the basis of predicted grades, which has been the tradition in this part of the world. So some things which previously were not possible have now very much come to the, to the fore. Maybe the final one would be uh, a recognition that actually we need to work as a, and see this as a system and system-wide leadership is becoming much more significant and possible on, on a number of fronts. And uh, again, we're beginning to see some degree of system-wide coordination, um, mental health and responses to student mental health as a system-wide agenda. Uh, racial harassment, interesting report just this morning from Universities UK, uh, really putting that to the foreground of concern and interest. So I think there's issues which are of social justice paramount importance becoming much more available for uh, consideration as well. Yes. I think you, you see much of that throughout the world, uh, Tom and Andreas. Um, in, um, I, I think the, the idea of leadership as a system has certainly evolved uh, here in West Virginia. Um, I have the privilege to be the, the president of the West Virginia Council of uh, Presidents, which is all of the, the universities. And the transformation that we have seen in the way that we relate to each other and that we provide information to each other has become, it's a metamorphosis. When we started in March, we viewed ourselves as competitors and would not share information because we were sharing trade secrets with each other. But as we soon found out that there was no roadmap to this pandemic and that we all had to mobilize and pivot very quickly to address the needs of our institutions, we became friends, we became allies, and we shared with each other best practices so that the other institutions did not have to reinvent the wheel, so to speak. Yeah. Rather, we could take turns at executing what was needed to run our universities. And so when we wrote a, an alert, we shared it. When we created a platform, we shared it. And so we were not all spinning our wheels individually, but rather we became that system that Tom describes. And I think that has served us well. Clearly, we all have different missions, but leadership at its core is about enabling others to become their best selves. And together, we were able um, to provide that. I also think that um, Adam's statement, as Tom cited, never waste a crisis, is also right on point. I think we have seen that throughout all of our universities, where there have been things that all of us have wanted to implement or do, but it was not necessarily the right time. Um, for us in my university, I've been wanting to introduce a winter term to increase retention, for example, so that our students who perhaps did not do all that well in a class 
were able to take that class over while still staying on their path to commencement, to graduation. Because we had to then revise our academic calendar so that there would be no breaks, so that we could create a bubble of our students to keep them protected and in a face-to-face -face environment, which we have. We started the semester face-to-face -face and we just finished the semester on Friday face-to-face. -face. Um, we It allowed us the opportunity to create that winter term that now affords the students an opportunity to take that course which in which they did not do all that well, but also it affords the university another source of income, you know, which we are then able to distribute and share with our, our units, uh, our academic units, so that they can go ahead and invest it. So out of it, out of chaos, innovation and creativity, partnerships and friendships have arisen. And I think as we look back at the proverbial footsteps foot, uh, in the sand many years from now, we will find the, the good of the pandemic for higher education and for humanity. Thank you. Thank you, Mirtha. Thank you very much. And uh, yes, spot on. Uh, you've already taken care of some of my questions that I wanted to put to you, and I'll put them now to Adam. Indeed, if we go beyond the institution, if we go uh, systems, exactly, as you were saying yourself, the collaboration, Mirtha, uh, what happened in uh, amongst your colleagues and peers, uh, and uh, Tom, you also mentioned that in systems thinking in leadership in higher education. My question to you, Adam, is um, how does one convince the public and stakeholders that higher education matters and that it is a vital part of the recovery process? And uh, possibly also, if you could maybe elaborate a little bit more on uh, something that Elsa Mirta touched upon. Are we seeing, you know, globally, are we seeing universities uh, coming out of this crisis that are stronger in terms of its uh, business unit character? Or are those universities coming out stronger that indeed have more like a Humboldtian uh, collegiate uh, academic character, um, if you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> I'll leave that to you. So uh, let me start on the public uh, stuff. I, you know, I think that actually we're in a very difficult moment globally. And I think that this predated the pandemic. There's a real trust deficit in all of our societies and that trust deficit is multiplied in in quite significant ways. It's a trust deficit between citizens and politicians. It's a trust deficit between citizens and business. It's a trust deficit within institutions themselves. And frankly, uh, there is uh, quite a significant part of all of our populations that have a sense of, uh, if you like, a trust deficit of what they see as elites. And whether you like it or not, universities in some way or the other began to be defined as their elites. And there's a kind of schizophrenic character. On the one hand, there's a, there's a, there is a concern about the elite and the institution. But simultaneously, there is a desire to access the institution because without the education, you can't, you can't progress. And so there's a kind of schizophrenic approach to this challenge. Um, and it seems to me that I wish I could say that all of this was, if you like, a mis mis misrepresentation. But frankly, I think that for the last 20, 30 years, all of our societies have allowed inequalities. And I look at inequalities at a multiplicity of levels, uh, e economic inequalities, racial inequalities, cultural and other inequalities to manifest and deepen without being appropriately addressed. And that is the context within which we enter this pandemic. <clears throat> uh, since uh, uh, the pandemic itself had very, very differential effects. If you were very well off, you could protect yourself from this pandemic in many ways. You could isolate, you could quarantine, you had bigger houses. If you didn't, weren't very well off, this pandemic had a much more adverse impact on you. 
your hospital systems in your areas were far less uh, substantive. Your ability to to socially distance at home was far less substantive, etc. And those consequences played themselves out. Uh, the mere fact that who could actually work from home and who couldn't uh, actually had a class dimension to it. So I think that all of that has uh, increased the skepticism of what they say is the unfairness of our particular societies. Having said that, this pandemic has also created the opportunity where universities have emerged to the fore in a way that no institutions have. Where does the new vaccines get created? Well, it gets created by researchers in these universities, AstraZeneca with Oxford, a whole series of other institutions in multi, and we've done a whole series of clinical trials at, at Wits University. I'm sure all of that has played out. But more than that, you saw our students rise to the challenge and provide protective equipment, provide screens in our engineering faculties and distribute that in multiplicity of ways. The fact that a vice chancellor in the middle of the UK decided to buy a thousand bicycles and deploy it to students, that all changes people's attitude to the institution. It shows it and it demonstrates empathy. It shows about care. And the point, it seems to me, is we need to, as vice chancellors, begin to engage in the public discourse. So yes, that's what we do, but you don't leave it there. In a sense, we have to rise to this moment to address the anti-intellectualism, the, the kind of distrust of universities and say, here's what the university could be. Yeah, it could be an institutional interlocutor to heal the nation, to heal the community within which you're located. And this is what we need to bring to the fore. And so in a sense, the ability of the university to play the role it is meant to play in a society is, is, is important. And it needs to be articulated. It needs to be a level of advocacy. If you like, I hate using the word, but Mita, what, what vice chancellors and presidents need to do is they need to spin the good uh, in a way that a wider part of society begins to appreciate. And I think that that's something, and in some institutions you can do it better than in others. Some contexts you can do it better than the others. But I think it's a necessary challenge for all of us. Yeah. Your second question about the business model. Well, here's the interesting thing. I actually think you know, I think there's two huge challenges that we emerging. Mirta spoke about the first, and that is the real crisis of the business model of higher education. And what she spoke about is, in a sense, what you are requested to do is far more with far less resources. Right. And that challenge is not a West Virginian challenge. It's a global challenge. Yes. Speak to institution after institution and that challenge emerges. We've got to reimagine the business model. And frankly, that business model has not been sufficiently thought through in relation to what society expects of these institutions. But there's a second challenge, Mirta, that I want to put on the table. <clears throat> and here's the challenge about this. What this pandemic has brought to the fore in the most dramatic of ways is that all of our challenges are transnational in character. Absolutely. Whether it's pandemic, whether it's climate change, whether it's any of these things, what you are looking at is a great challenge. Yes. What you have to address these global challenges is you need institutional capacity and you need human capabilities. Without institutional capacity and human capabilities, you can't do that. But what that reimagines is us reimagining the higher education itself. Because to be honest, higher education at the moment, global partnerships works. Find talented people in the developing world, bring them to London, New York, and Beijing, and then train them. And 80% of them never return. And then you have both institutional capacity is weakening, but also human capabilities weakening. And what this pandemic shows, however good you are in West Virginia or in London, so long as there's somebody in Burundi with the problem, 
they can jump on a plane and land up in New York and the pandemic starts again. So we've got to create institutional capabilities to address this. But to do that, we need to reimagine it. We need digital technology allows you to teach beyond instances, beyond nations. Our libraries could be deployed uh, globally for people to access, etc. So we need to reimagine that. But we can't reimagine that without reimagining the business model. If you're asking Mirta to help somebody in Burundi, but she's going to get in a financial crisis in West Virginia, it's not feasible. So there's a reimagination, not only at a domestic level, but at a transnational level around higher education. And I suspect that we're not having enough of that conversation. And we're not thinking that question through. And that, for me, is the second part I want to put under the agenda. And, and I concur wholeheartedly. I think that in a utopian world, I would imagine, and my hope would be that not unlike what we have done here in this stage, is that universities and colleges throughout the world could come together in some sort of consortia so that we do not need to duplicate each other's resources. But in the example that you gave, Adam, with libraries, with digital libraries, what a formidable way to have a, a, a world library, if you would, that because everyone belongs to that consortia, our cost to that library is much lower than the cost that we are now investing in our own personal university-led libraries, which are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. So, so how could we pull the collective knowledge and wisdom and resources of global universities in, in a way that's what IAU does? You know, it brings us together as universities to discuss issues of the world, to have the consensus, the wisdom of various diverse minds throughout the world with different access to different resources. So I would imagine a place like an IAU that would create this consortia and you would be you would sign into it and have all of this, this incredible knowledge at your fingertips that we are all amassing, but it's only for our institutions. And thus, because there are no economies of scale, then that price is so much more contrained and so much higher. And so that opportunity cost of being able to divert some of the resources to other areas that are unique to the institutions that cannot be shared, like a library, then become paramount. I think that's the future of a, of a, of a world, of a model for true collaboration of higher education, not just in West Virginia, in the United States, but through the world. Just uh, building on that, and both both comments from <clears throat> from Adam and Mirta. I mean, it, several thoughts come to mind. One is absolutely the truth decay, as uh, the Rand Corporation coined the term, of the trust deficit, big time, a big issue. Universities are uniquely placed to be a convening authority, a place for these conversations to take place, and one which we could woefully do with uh, is a conversation about follow the science. Uh, yeah, evidence-based decision-making, those sorts Amen. of questions, which we're ill-equipped uh, and yet we desperately need to be able to, to deal with. Secondly, in terms of access to higher education, in the UK we are very privileged to have something called the Open University, which has had a tradition for many years of being this open access university, online and so on. In theory, we've now got 156 open universities. And so we've got capacity which could be utilized in a different way, but we don't need 156 duplicating everything to the same extent. Uh, Alex Usher in Canada put a plea out to universities in Canada to say, come on folks, could we not have the learned societies in our disciplines convene and curate the materials which we need for our delivery? It, still academics have privileged access to add their sparkle and imagination, but actually we could share resources and share the pain, if you like, or share the, 
a capacity to, to address it. And finally, on the business model issue, I think we've seen winners and losers in the UK, and it will come, we'll see what, how things pan out. I had a, an email over the weekend from a, a, a colleague saying, does this mean there's going to be more mergers and acquisitions activity in universities in the UK? And I said, well, I hope it's not the only response, and I think it's a dangerous response if that's how we perceive it, because combining two universities, even in the same town, conceptually from a business viewpoint, looks like a sensible thing to do. But actually, it's completely, there's very little evidence that we've had any success at doing that in our side of the water. So I think a system-wide perspective of seeing collaboration and a collaboration across the tertiary education system between further, what we call further education and higher education so that access and routes and pathways, I hope, might open up even more so and the sharing of the resources across the, the system in a region might actually be a more productive route. And I think we may see some more of that that never waste a crisis moment coming coming our way. Wonderful, thank you, Tom. Um, unfortunately, we're running out of time, so I will pass the word to Hilliche, uh, and one of us will disappear. I don't know quite who, it's so just for technical reasons. Uh, so I will say goodbye, but let me thank you very, very much for these for this very, very enticing, very stimulating conversation indeed, and uh, also to Mirta for, um, for uh, raising the flag of the International Association of Universities indeed, because I do think, and I genuinely do think that the IAU with its global outreach and its global perspective is really a platform on which to have some of the conversations that all of you have just touched upon, a system-wide perspective. And uh, indeed one where the idea of the university and associated with that also the business model of the university globally needs to be defined, redefined, imagined, and uh, and then hopefully also implemented when, wherever it can. I'll pass on the words, uh, the floor to Hilleche, and I thank you so much for this very, very interesting talk this afternoon and this morning. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Hilleche, the floor is yours if you're coming in. It's interesting. Um, it's interesting, but now um, Adam has left. <laughs> so you become Adam, uh, Andreas. But thank you so very much to the three speakers for the very interesting conversation that we've just had. Um, we tried to, to look at how to maybe um, uh, define or, or uh, look at a model that could be used to actually describe what is happening to leadership today. And thank you, Tom, for the framework that you shared with us as a starting point for the debate. Uh, and then to look at the different perspectives and the experiments and the, 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 the ways in which Adam or Mirta, you have been navigating your uh, enormous machines and, and, and uh, uh, the, uh, the institutions that you had to steer through uh, the pandemic and still will have to steer through through the pandemic because it's not over. Um, what I found very interesting is, is how you picked it up and, and what are the points that you brought to the fore in terms of uh, facilitating um, the continuation of teaching, of learning, of research, of, of cooperation, of positioning the university in a different um, uh, context as well, uh, a context of more participatory approaches to higher education of more sharing uh, which is the beauty maybe of this pandemic uh, the realization as was very strongly said by Adam as well that everything local is um, also connected to the global we will uh, always have this connection and we knew that it was there but uh, we didn't maximize the opportunities actually and we did uh, all stay to our stick to our world to our limits somehow and did not dare cross the boundaries in the ways that we did it today and as was said by all three of you in different forms and shapes is uh, very important also to see that we should not forget about what we've learned and where we've gone and where we've dared go 
uh, together uh, in terms of uh, really looking at things not any longer as much through a lens of competition, but rather of uh, cooperation, which is very difficult for universities to do in the current business model that has been adopted by too many universities around the world. Um, and it is true that I, I noted down this, that this real crisis uh, and, the, and the crisis not to be wasted, uh, I've looked it up a, a while ago because that is something that is coming up in conversations that actually is Machiavelli who uh, coined the, the phrase at first in the Renaissance period where there were so many crises that had to be addressed. And so maybe Machiavellic in a way, but positive because it needs to be looked at in as a, as a, a time in which opportunities have been seized. People have gone in directions where they never wanted to go before. Um, were it the staff or the students or uh, the leadership for you as leaders in your institution. So yes, to reimagine the world in which we live and the world uh, in which you operate as leaders uh, is, is uh, essential. You're doing so, but doing it collectively is, is the beauty of this period. And then the challenge of uh, the transnationality and the uh, internationality of things is, is a, a big issue that you all raised. Um, and also the issue of interdisciplinarity. And I also wanted to pick up on uh, the importance of the leadership today uh, that you raised, Mirta, when you said, well, it's also very important to make sure that the leadership is protecting or fostering or or even promoting those disciplines that are at risk of falling off um, the, the, the landscape of higher education because there's no return on investment. I think it's one of the of the, 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 the words that you used and it is it was a risk already before. Why social sciences, humanities? No need for that. You don't have a real a return on those different points, but we see today how important they are. We need to rethink our society. And we talked about those who are, have no access, those who are not included, those who are um, at risk of never going back to university. So it is a real social issue that we're facing today and very important to, to, uh, to also um, continue to look at that. But I also there liked the, the point that Adam, you made when you said, don't forget social justice but let's make sure that social justice doesn't become the lowest possible common de denominator because we need to look at the whole spectrum. We need to look at all the different aspects of an institution and we need to see the institution and the higher education institutions and universities for that matter as a pillar of our societies. And so we should not shy away from a certain form of elitism uh, that, that people see in a negative light and that you all three also said. It's important to also look at that in, in positive ways and see where the universities actually play a role today. Uh, the very local missions of universities with a, a global uh, outreach. And there are many projects coming up. A big one now in Europe in which uh, IAU is also getting involved in with the Council of Europe and a consortium in the US and in Latin America. Um, a project on the local mission of universities. Not that it was not there but it was maybe not visible enough. And that is a point that Tom also very often made in, in the sessions that we've had in the leading globally um, um, uh, engaged universities where the universities play a role at the global level, at the local level, and they, they have to work uh, together uh, more specifically. Somebody mentioned the Sustainable Development Goals Agenda 2030. That is today, actually. So we already look way beyond the, the 2030 agenda and into the future um, that the role of higher education is better recognized by the policymakers and by society. And you all made that point uh, very clearly. So thank you indeed uh, for seeing the IAU as a global university. <laughs> we hope that you all enjoyed these webinars where we bring in all those different perspectives. And I thank the, um, the speakers for their generosity in, in agreeing to uh, share their points of views in, in these webinars that are very dear to uh, the, the people who follow them. We see they're not only uh, watched live, but they're sometimes watched by whole groups in institutions. So there's one connect and then there's a classroom behind. 
in Turkmenistan, in Zimbabwe, in uh, Peru, or in uh, in Sweden. So it's from all parts of the world that you're being uh, um, listened to, and and it gives way to very nice discussions as well around the globe, because it's also then used later when the when the recordings are being made available and picked up by many. So the, your your contributions are absolutely essential. And giving and sharing those different perspectives on the challenges you face and the opportunities that are out there are essential to feed the debates that you all said was so important. Just for you to know, um, there are three more sessions coming up on 3 December. Next week, we will talk about SDG 16, which is the Sustainable Development Goals on uh, peace building and justice, and actually talking about the truth and the trust part as well, and how SDG 16 relating to SDG 4, quality education, and many other ideas are actually finding a resonance uh, anew through higher education. And there we work uh, in collaboration with UNODC, the United Nations Office um, for Against Drugs and Crime. And we will see how the universities around the world are picking up on uh, an SDG that is not always evident to pick up throughout uh, the institution. And then on 9 December, we invite you for a festive webinar uh, that will celebrate the very um, day of uh, the signature of the signing of the IEU constitution back uh, on 9 December, uh, back in 1950. The IEU was called into life by UNESCO uh, at the time. We've always uh, um, made sure that we uh, kept an independent voice so that higher education institutions can respond to governments that are repre represented at UNESCO. But we have strong ties with our uh, mother home, let's say, and we're always still based at UNESCO. We would have loved to bring you to Paris on that occasion. Not possible now, unfortunately, but we will see uh, in particular also Marta speak to that event uh, on 9 December and thank you uh, for that as well. And we will have a second session of that web webinar to look at the future of higher education with three speakers from again, three very different parts of the world. And then we will close this uh, series for 2020 uh, to start anew in 2021, but we will close this, the series on 15 December with a special session with uh, the um, jointly organized with the Magna Carta Observatory, because we would like to emphasize the importance of value-based uh, leadership and value-based higher education for the future as well. And that is where we will uh, look uh, into the new text of the Magna Carta, which is now a global one, which emphasizes also the importance of this strong uh, link between the local and the global. So I'm uh, taking almost all times, but maybe Tom and Mirta, unfortunately, Adam, you're not with us um, uh, on the screen, but you may wish to have a, a last, last word before we close this, uh, this beautiful session. So maybe Mirta. <laughs> Um, thank you all for affording us the opportunity to come together and share our thoughts with colleagues around the world. This is a time for unity, and I think that higher education is positioning itself to lead the way to chart that unity as we go forward for a better world. So thank you. Thank you. And Tom? Thank you. Uh, just to say it's always a delight to engage in conversations through these networks and realize there's a lot more connects us together than uh, we have differences in our views uh, and how we can each learn from each other's experience in different locations. So continue the good work, uh, LH and Andreas, with your, your webinars. These are really important and I, I can see the value of them. I think with thank that you. dog bark, it's time to go. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you to all the participants and we will share the link to the webinar so that you can watch it again. And we invite you to next steps. And Adam, uh, only sorry to not see you, give you the floor, but I hope uh, I resonated with some of your points here uh, in my conclusion. So thank you all and have a very nice day or evening, uh, depending on where you are. Um, and see you next time. Thank Once you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.